Okay, so um, I mean, my, my presentation uh, basically has one thesis, which is the major change in the world economy over the last two years, as last two decades or three decades um, since uh, uh, UNU wider was established, has been the emergence of two middles. And I'm going to talk about those two middles, where they've, came, where they've come from and what they might mean for the future of development economics. But the first thing you do, obviously, whenever you prepare a presentation is you, you go to Google Images. Um, and so I thought I'd look at, at the 1985, wider established. It's, it's just a reminder just how long ago uh, we're thinking here in terms of, of 30 years. Perestroika, Live Aid, uh, one of the early generations of desktop commuters uh, looks enormous. And the top grossing film uh, in that year was Back to the Future. So I thought, OK, there, there's, 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 there's a narrative for a, for a, for a, a presentation in the sense that I think the, for development economics, the issues are actually not that much different from 30 years ago, but with a twist. So the issues are still about growth, structural change, industrialization. But 30 years on, for most countries, they're now about doing that at much higher levels of output per capita, uh, much lower levels of aid, uh, and for many developing countries, uh, at populous developing countries, at higher levels of inequality, net genies. And I'll talk a bit about that. So the presentation outlines the two middles and then talks about what really changed, because actually the two middles are based on drawing lines uh, for poor countries and poor people in order to generate the thesis. Um, and then ask, after what really changed across the developing world, think a bit about uh, what do these two new, two new middles mean? So first of all, the, the first middle is, is an expansion in the number of middle income countries. Okay, uh, Since the late 1980s, total number of middle income countries has increased by about 40. There's also been this shift of, uh, of populations above what are very low poverty lines of one or two dollars a day into what might be referred to as not far above uh, a low poverty line, what uh, Guy Stanley refers to as the precariat, a kind of precarious group of people who are not that far from poverty. So as I said, I think you know, if you if you look at these issues, the, the 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 issues haven't changed that much from the kind of things that Arthur Lewis, Simon Kuznets, uh, Dudley Sears were talking about uh, in 50s, 60s, and 70s. But there is there is a twist in the sense that the countries are actually at much higher levels of of, of GDP per capita. There are substantial domestic resources in, in many developing countries that didn't exist uh, 30 years ago. And for most developing countries, actually, aid is pretty low and not really that significant anymore, apart from the very poorest countries. Obviously, the LDCs are a very important group there. And for many developing countries, actually, the populous developing countries where most of the world live, or certainly where most of the world's poor live, uh, there is higher net inequality. So the two new middles. Uh, as I said, there's, since the end of the Cold War, almost 40 countries crossing the, the, uh, the official definition into middle income. That's only $1,000 uh, in exchange rate conversion, but about 2,500 in PPP. Those countries, although that's a very low threshold, and I'll come back to that in a moment, those countries are substantially better off across a range of indicators than the countries left behind. So although at one level, crossing a line in income per capita doesn't make that much difference in life, at another level, the countries that have done it are substantially better off. Most of them are. Some of them, uh, it's a bit more complicated, which I'll, I'll refer to in a moment. The thresholds have all sorts of problems, um, not least the logic on what they're originally based on. And I think we shouldn't forget that. Um, and if you want to divide the world into four, four groups of countries, uh, low, lower middle income, upper middle income, high income, then you'd need something, a uh, threshold a bit higher, actually. Uh, but but, but the, the, the classifications are still symbolic. They, for many uh, developing country leaders, the attainment of middle income status is seen as a goal in itself. Many national development plans include middle income status in, in 2025 or 2030. And actually, they matter a lot to donors because there's a, there's a kind of assumption, I think, that once you cross this line, you somehow aid can't do anything useful anymore uh, because there are domestic resources. And I think that's questionable. Uh, perhaps what's something for discussion. But also poverty fell. I, I take a slightly higher poverty line here, $2.50, and, and use 2011 PPPs, uh, just so that I can show you, even with a higher poverty line, there's still an expanding middle. And that middle is only likely to expand further over the next, uh, up to 2030. So first of all, just to give you a sense of the countries, the green is low income, L, the red, lower middle income, blue, upper middle income, 
whenever, whenever Rolf looks at his watch or the chair looks at his watch, you get nervous. <laughs> I've only done five minutes. Um, black is high income. Don't look too much. Uh, the, the, the important thing here, I guess, is uh, the number of countries that are at the bottom in terms of taking this definition. I didn't realize that was hanging off me. Um, uh, have, have in general fallen as countries have gone into the middle. Now, it depends whether you're an optimist or a pessimist as to how things are going to play out in the next 20 years. If you take the IMF's World Economic Outlook country by country projections, then in 2030, there'll only be 15 low income countries. OK, if you're a little bit more cautious and you cut that in half or take historical growth rates, then the countries that are currently low income are low income for a very long time. And that's because most of them, most of the remaining low income are actually less developed countries now. So the countries that probably could take off in terms of growth uh, more easily are the ones that have already done. And I'd probably take the line that I think perhaps the countries that remain at the bottom are the ones that may remain for some considerable time. The different lines there are, are different scenarios based on taking the IMF's projections. Uh, the IMF projections minus 1%, which is the historical error, which is moderate. The IMF's projections on growth also tally with US electoral cycles, interestingly enough. Um, you might raise an eyebrow. Uh, and the optimistic scenario is simply uh, taking them at face value, the pessimistic at half. And then if you look at people, the, uh, so I've taken a low poverty line at $2.50, $10. Per, of course, all these lines are arbitrary. It, it, merely drawing lines to kind of generate a thesis. The logic of these are that at $10 a day, you have substantially more security from falling back into poverty based on studies in Latin America. Uh, it also, if you're around $10 a day, it puts you in the poorest decile in OECD countries. So if you wanted a truly global poverty line, $10 might give you that. There you go there. At the lower end, $2.50 is approximately the same level of income as multi-dimensional poverty headcounts, about 1.6, 1.7 billion people. So that's the logic at the lower end. But of course, the World Bank is, a, is about to announce something closer to $1.80 as the, as the update to the, to the, uh, the poverty lines. And then, it, I mean, it doesn't really make a huge amount of difference whether you take optimistic growth or pessimistic growth. And I, we did trends for inequality. Either you extrapolate inequality based on historical trends or you assume a country returns back to its historically lowest inequality point. Because you can't really expect countries to be more equal than they have ever been historically. That was Rolf's idea from a, a conference about two or three years ago. Um, you, you see the influence you have. Um, and so what this is, is as poverty at the lower lines has fallen and may continue to fall, hopefully, at, lo at higher poverty lines, there's not that much change and it depends what happens. But you've got this kind of, kind of burgeoning group in the middle. So those are the two middles, but they're obviously they're based on drawing lines over the world. Um, so the next question to just think about is what actually changed? Uh, and so if you plot all developing countries, uh, uh, the, the lower one is uh, the early 90s. The upper one is triangles, is, is uh, more recently, 2010, 2012. And I've labeled some of the big middle income countries just for, for interest. First thing is substantial amounts of it, uh, growth across the developing world, apart from at the bottom, in GDP, PP per capita. Not so much convergence overall with the rich world, although some countries have moved up the chain, some countries have moved down. But overall, there's not that much convergence. Obviously, for some specific countries, there are. Quite a substantial decline in ODA over GNI. Uh, again, you know, more kind of bunch in there. So aid has become much less important than it was, or much less uh, visible than it was. Some structural change, but only right at the top. Again, there's, not, there's a bit in the middle there and a bit up the top. Not a lot of structural change. This is agriculture over GDP. A lot of urbanization across the developing world, uh, which I think is interesting and important. And net inequality has gone up in some countries and down in others. It's actually gone up in the populous developing countries that have been growing fast uh, and down in many of the, the, the poorer countries. So there's your two middles. Um, on the left hand side, almost 40 new middle income countries. They split quite, quite evenly between four groups. I think there's probably 11 genuine countries in terms of genuine development. There's eight pseudo mix, which are sub-Saharan Africa. These are countries that are better off in exchange rate income per capita 
but not better off in PPP, GDP per capita. And what may have happened is that growth has been driven by commodities, or the PPPs are complete nonsense and rubbish, but we use them anyway. Uh, anyone's guess is which way you could go on that. There are nine former planned economies, which is uh, from the first presentation. Those are bounce backs. Basically, as, as we saw, they went white down and then went up. Uh, and then there's, a lot of, uh, there's another 11 quite small countries. And on the other side, we've now got 3 billion people in this middle, if you take my cutoffs. If you extend the cutoffs, obviously you extend the numbers. Half of the world's population, neither poor uh, nor probably secure from poverty. Half of this number in China and India, the rest in other parts of the world. Most middle-income countries, the majority of the population is now in the middle. Okay? That doesn't mean people are secure. It probably means they're just not poor on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but they're at risk of falling back into poverty. And that's why things like social protection and measures to address so, uh, insecurity, I think, will be increasingly important. So what does this all mean for development economics, he says, with three minutes late? Three, no, three minutes to go. <laughs> so I, I think actually, you know, that has that much changed for development economics? It's still the same issues of growth, structural change, poverty reduction, addressing inequality. Um, but those issues now have to be answered or addressed or researched or explored when most of the developing world is at much higher uh, GDP per capita in a developing world where most countries' ODA is, is almost insignificant. Uh, even in, in countries uh, in parts of Africa. Uh, and for many developing countries that have had structural change and are populous, net inequality is actually substantially higher. Uh, and I'll come to some of the data just on that in a moment. This gave me three thoughts. First of all, Dudley Sears. I was wondering, oh, right, five minutes. I was wondering what, Dud what, what would Dudley Sears say to all of this? Um, I'm sure he was here. He must have been there at the opening of Wider. I'm looking at Rolf in case he was there in 1985. Um, well, first of all, I think you'd, you'd hear a kind of scream. Well, you've got the scream up in the top right-hand corner. Um, first of all, growth without growth. So some developing countries have actually achieved middle-income status uh, by exchange rate growth. Uh, you know, they, if you convert their growth rates into exchange rate uh, dollars, or convert the, uh, the, the local currency into dollars through exchange rates, you see a, a substantial growth, but not if you do it through PPPs. Uh, there's many countries, uh, I'll show you the data in a moment, where unequivocally net inequality has risen dramatically. Uh, and this raises questions, I think, about the future sustainability of growth, but also the, the social instability that rising, rapidly rising inequality can, can, can mean. But also, for the most part, uh, even if people are in this middle, they're still probably highly insecure uh, and only maybe one growth slowdown or one health shock away from poverty. So the, the, the idea that poverty is going to be ended by 2030 or indeed we've made drastic movements towards poverty reduction so far is a valid statement if you take one or two dollars a day. But if you think living on something as, as, as extravagant as ten dollars a day, then you'd probably ask a few more questions. The median uh, um, consumption for developing countries is now four dollars a day. Okay, so that's all developing countries, which is not, you know, that that significant. The global median is five point five. Uh, secondly, what, what would Simon Kuznet say, given that, you know, for the most part, the ideas around the Kuznets curve have been largely thrown out as a universal uh, question? I mean, as we'll see in a moment, I think actually uh, Kuznets is, is back with a vengeance in the in the very populous countries that have had substantial growth and structural change away from agriculture, there's, there's drastically rising inequality. Uh, and what would, Lewis, what would Arthur Lewis say about growth without structural change in the, in the countries that have achieved middle income status but are actually largely commodity or agricultural countries? I think he'd, he'd probably turn in his grave. Um, and a hypothesis to put on the table uh, before concluding is that it seems to me, uh, when I did a cluster analysis, actually a lot if you look at a country's export structure, it can pretty much tell you about its, the country's poverty, it can tell you about the country's politics, it can tell you about uh, the, the country's uh, public sector. And I thought that might be an interesting line to, to follow up. So on the left-hand side, we have the new middle-income countries with growth and structural change. Uh, Angola, Bangladesh, China, Ghana, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Vietnam. These countries have had very large increases in GDP per capita PPP. Most of them 
have had substantial increases in Gini, although it's been squashed by China's big one, so the scale is, you know. Um, and all of them have had, a sort of, with the exception of Pakistan, have had uh, a substantial move away from agriculture in, just in the period since the Cold War. On the other side, we have a number of countries uh, where growth uh, uh, has been actually, in PPP terms, very limited, if you accept the PPPs are correct. I mean, that's a big if. Those countries, actually, inequality has gone up and down a bit. There's no overall pattern. Uh, and some of those countries have had structural change, but actually that's been structural change towards uh, uh, non-agriculture, so fuels and, and commodities. And the reason I mentioned the export uh, issue is, I mean, interesting enough, when you look across the, uh, 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 the set of countries, and perhaps, you know, it's almost certain, uh, you know, exports are going to be correlated with uh, GDP per capita and many of the other variables, perhaps. And this is what, what, what's coming out. So it's a question of which way, if any, a causation goes, or whether you can just tell a lot about a country by looking at its export structure. So many of the countries that have had more development, meaning growth and structural change, have tended to be, to, tended to have reasonable or some kind of contribution from manufacturing, uh, with the exception of a couple of fuel exporters, Nigeria and Sudan, uh, who have had substantial amounts of growth uh, <coughs> um, in PPP terms and structural change. Uh, and then maybe the, with the, with the pseudo-mix, it's much more a question of uh, the fuel has, has taken on much more of a significance, but actually food and agricultural uh, exports are still very important, or ores and metals. So what to conclude from this? Uh, back to my back to the future. So the argument is that the, the big change over the last 30 years since WIDA was established is the emergence of, of these two middles, or two new middles. So rather than the world of poor poor countries and poor people, we're actually looking at a world, over the, particularly over the next 20 years, that's more, peop more a question of not very poor countries and very poor people, but countries and people who are somehow in the middle, maybe not poor on a day-to-day -day basis for, for people, but actually not that far away from poverty. But th that also raises issues about insecurity, stresses, shocks. I think there's an issue for development economics, which is... Uh, Actually, you've got different, very different types of countries. So whereas development economics was, fairly, was much more straightforward in the 70s, developing countries had similar characteristics, as Sears noticed, you're now talking about a group of very poor countries, the least developed countries, versus countries who are actually, some of whom are at much higher income, lower aid, higher inequality. So that sets up three questions to conclude on. The first is, how or why, uh, possibly for the next 30 years, when, when we're all here for, for wider 60, in 2045. Of course, the, the SDGs will have been met many years before. Um, how, how and why growth is or isn't accompanied by structural change. There's interesting theories, obviously, the Golin et al. theory on consumption cities and urbanization. There's also the Roderick thesis, thesis on premature industrialization that are relevant. Then I think there's questions about Kuznets and softening the upswing. I mean, I remember a, a, a friend when I was in Indonesia said to me, if, if it looks like, I mean, Indonesia is having substantial increase in, in inequality, how, how does a country go through structural change, growth with structural change, and how do you stop inequality suddenly increasing when you have large proportions of the population moving? How, you know, what's, what does that even look like? So there's an interesting question there, I think, about if, we, you know, the, the, the issues of structural change and industrialization have come across particularly strongly over the last couple of days. Uh, but how do you manage the upswing of the, the Kuznets curve if it exists in those countries? Uh, and then finally, uh, an overall shift from, from what might be termed poverty to, to precarity. Uh, so that suggests more, more focus on stresses, shocks, and maybe linking things like the middle income trap. So the, the, one of the impacts of these, the, the new middle is that the consuming class, the real middle class in developing countries, is expanding very slowly. And I define, I define that here as those over $10 a day. Um, and that means you may slow down political change because the tax base is so weak and tax has a very strong relationship with political change. Uh, you may also hinder future growth because the consuming class uh, is actually still quite small. Thank you. Mm -hmm.